So I'm uh, Dean Kraft, and this is Tom Kramer, and we're going to be talking about our Link Data for Libraries project today. I'm going to take the first half, and Tom's going to take the second. Um, so we'll start out with, uh, there are going to be a lot of sort of pieces and parts that I will be uh, giving quick introductions to, and then talking about how we're trying to fit, fit everything together. So let's start with the project itself. Um, so this is a project funded by Mellon, Link Data for Libraries. It's a collaboration of Cornell, Harvard, and Stanford. Started this past January. And we're working together to develop an ontology and a set of data sources that provide relationships, metadata, and broad context for scholarly information resources. So just think of anything your library or museum or archive would catalog. And the project leverages a lot of previous work, um, particularly strongly the previous work in the Vivo project and the Hydra partnership. And uh, we'll talk about that as we go along. So uh, the vision for the project um, is to create a linked open data standard to exchange all that libraries know about their resources, a, a modest goal. Um, so a bit more specifically, we're creating a model that works within individual institutions and through a coordinated network of linked open data to capture the intellectual value that librarians and other domain experts add to information resources when they describe, annotate, organize, select, and use those resources together with the social value evident from patterns of usage. And we'll get very specific in terms of use cases and so on about what we're trying to do a bit later in the talk. So, so what does this mean? I mean, so right now um, we have our wonderful library catalog that lets people search and find resources, but it turns out there's an awful lot of information that we have in siloed systems that doesn't feed in at all to that discovery environment that, uh, that informs search in no way. So we have a wonderful registry of all sorts of digital collections that is currently unconnected with our Blacklight catalog search. Um, Another example, um, we use a system called LibGuides, where uh, reference librarians do a lot of work to, to provide specific resources for um, research areas. So here's an example where a, um, a research librarian has, has done a reference guide for, uh, let's see, feminist, gender, and sexuality studies. So pulled, called out a whole set of important resources from the catalog and from other um, potentially other sources that would be of value to somebody looking in this area. But again, if you go to our Blacklight search, if you search our catalog, there's nothing that boosts the relevance of these materials. There's nothing that indicates that something you find there is part of this research guide. They're totally disconnected. These things are in silos. So another example, um, we used to have a wonderful physical engineering uh, library that you could walk into and sitting in front of you would be a shelf of engineering handbooks. Well, the engineering library is now a virtual library, but we had no way to represent that shelf of engineering handbooks. So we created a little system called the Curated List of Library Resources that lets you pull out specific resources and, and make them available, either by call number ranges or individual selections. So now, using this system, we can model that shelf um, but again, it's still unconnected from the main library search. A second example, our Clark Physical Sciences Library calls out classic texts in physics, astronomy, and chemistry and makes those available uh, for students in those areas. So we have all these siloed sources of curated information that librarians have worked on that don't really inform the complete discovery system in our libraries. And we wanted to... Uh, to help solve that problem. Last example, um, we have an entomology collection. Our entomology library is now also virtual. Um, it's basically a subset of a larger library, but, uh, but we want to have a curated, focused collection in entomology to make that material available and discoverable outside of the sort of broad set of materials in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences Library. So, reference collection. Um, one more example of information that we would like to be able to include to inform and enhance discovery. 
Um, if you search our catalog for Philo of Larissa, you'll find a resource written by Charles Britton, who happens to be a Cornell faculty member. Wouldn't it be lovely for us to be able to draw on that information to give the, uh, the researcher more understanding about what this, uh, what this author is, what he does, um, how can we pull this all together? So that, that's sort of the motivation for, uh, for part of the project. Um, let's do one more of the building blocks, uh, talk a little about what is linked data. I'm, I'm, I think I less and less need to give this set of slides, but in case there's anybody in the audience who's not at all familiar with linked data. Um, linked data is structured information, not just documents and text, in a common, simple format. It's open, available, visible, mineable. You can basically go to a URL and, and get the structured data from it. And anyone can post and consume and reuse it. And it's linked, so directly by reference, a URL, URI, and indirectly via common references and inference. And the sort of basic underlying building block for all linked data are these RDF triples, which have a subject, a predicate, and an object. So for example, Italy has a border with Austria, or there you can make literal statements as well. Italy has uh, UN geocode uh, 380. So these very simple statements then let you build up relationships and networks of information. So why do we choose to use linked data for this project? It's a flexible and extensible framework that we can use to describe, organize, and relate scholars, scholarship, and the whole scholarly context. There are a wide range of tools, systems, ontologies, and vocabularies already available in the linked uh, data environment. And it's a growing ecosystem of developer standards and sources of relevant linked open data. So here's a picture of the current uh, 2014 instance of the, the linked data cloud. Um, if you go back, you can see um, to the uh, linkcloud.net site there, um, you can see how it's grown over the years. Um, it's, it's getting pretty big. There's a lot of information out there that we can potentially leverage, take advantage of, and link to. So another building block, a system called Vivo. So Vivo is an open source semantic web based researcher and research discovery tool. It essentially manages um, and makes available researcher profiles and all the context around researchers. So it's also data, institution-wide publicly visible information about research and researchers. It's a standard, a standard ontology, the Vivo data ontology that interconnects researchers, communities, and campuses using linked open data. And it's an open community of, of developers with strong national and international participation. So Vivo itself is a semantic web application. I've said this before, it provides data that's readable by machines, not just by people, although readable by people as well. It provides self-describing data via shared ontologies with defined types and relationships. So like the little RDF triples I showed you, they're a set of defined relationships for all those kinds of links between, uh, between objects, provides search and query augmented by those relationships, and does simple kinds of reasoning to categorize and find associations. For example, if you have a faculty member who's teaching a course, that's a teaching faculty. Um, so here's sort of the, the Vivo environment showing some of the kinds of relationships. Vivo connects scientists and scholars with and through their research and scholarship. So it may be their shared co-authors or PIs. Maybe they have a, a positions in the same organizational structure within the institution. Maybe they're working on the same project. They have a shared grant. Uh, they were cited in the same newspaper article. All sorts of ways that these um, scholars can interrelate. So let's get back to the Linked Data for Libraries project how the Linked Data for Libraries builds on Vivo. So it brings the relationship and identifier-based architecture of Vivo to mainstream library use cases and applications. The Linked Data for Libraries ontology draws on the existing Vivo ontology and ontology design patterns. We're using the software that underlies the Vivo application called Vitro, which it turns out you can pull out the Vivo ontology and plug in any ontology you want and have this 
complete semantic web system as a tool for linked data for libraries. Our demonstration search will be built on an existing, uh, on an adaptation of a demonstration system we build across seven institutions for Vivo at vivosearch.org. And we'll be linking existing Vivo data, as in the example I showed you before at Cornell, um, with data, Vivo data from uh, Cornell, from the Harvard Faculty Finder, and from standard community academic pro Stanford Community Academic Profile data. So another component of the project um, is the BibFrame effort that's been going on for a while. Um, so the Library of Congress uh, developed the BibFrame ontology as the eventual replacement for MARC, current cataloging standard for library resources. Um, both the Library of Congress and Zephira have developed converters that produce BibFrame RDF, those little triples, uh, from existing MARC XML. So you might ask why we're using BibFrame as our, uh, as our bibliographic standard. Vivo itself uses uh, Bibbo and, and there are other bibliographic ontologies out there. Um, we are academic libraries. This uh, MARC, we take advantage of all the information that's in MARC and we need to be able to make use of all of that information as part of the, the linked data for libraries effort. Um, so we want to mainstream the use of, uh, of this, this data within the libraries. Um, in case you're not familiar with BibFrame, it it's a, um, provides structured information with the notion of both works and instances, where instances would have a particular publisher and published location, where the work itself would be about a subject um, by a particular creator, and it's sort of a, it's a somewhat of a simplification of the, the Ferber model, um, but it still captures a lot of the, the kinds of context that you want about um, your resources and, and really does capture pretty fully what Mark can express. So the issue is translating Mark records just into RDF will not in and of itself make useful link data. We need identifiers. Um, we need local identifiers for statements made by our own institutions where we're using local authority information. Um, we need global identifiers for the things we want to share for people, organizations, uh, places, and other things. I mean, even among our three libraries, we need to discover shared, we need to use shared global identifiers so that we can make connections across the three members of the project. And we're seeking to use standard external identifiers as well, OCLC work URIs, uh, VIAF and ORCIDs, um, and lots of other standards. So a goal of linked data in general, and our project in particular, is to go from the sort of standard metadata string expression for, for things, people, whatever, to actual URIs that really represent the thing for people, organizations, places, subjects, and all the rest. Um, we, are working with, we are working now within our project with OCLC work identifiers. Um, so OCLC WorldCat is a union catalog of bibliographic identifiers. Um, OCLC has worked to create these UR, common work URIs across their bibliographic resources. Um, we've actually mapped our own OCLC IDs to the work URIs and discovered that um, there's quite a lot of, well, there's a lot of overlap from our own materials into work URIs at OCLC, and there's actually a pretty significant degree of overlap in works among our institutions. So far we've looked at, so Harvard has 82% of its um, bib records can be matched to work identifiers. Stanford and Cornell, um, almost of the resources we each have that have OCLC work IDs, um, almost half of them can be, uh, can be matched between the institutions. This then lets us um, combine information, annotation and usage information, I'll talk, we'll talk about this a bit more as we go into the use cases, among the three institutions, which is one of the main goals of the project. We're creating this linked data, we're showing how it can be used to, uh, to combine information across all three of our um, institutions. And of course, if it can work for three, from three you can go to many, many, many. 
Okay, a little bit about the Linked Data for Libraries ontology. Um, I've already mentioned BibFrame, which is our, uh, what we're using for sort of library bibliographic information. Um, we're using a, an ontology called Fabio for some additional bibliographic types and relationships. Uh, for people organizations, we're using um, Vivo and ISF, although a kind of a subset of it, which includes the friend of a friend ontology, which is a big standard in the, the general linked uh, data world. We're using the open annotation um, standard for annotations, uh, PAV for provenance, for virtual collections and structured relationships, some of the kind of curated information I was showing you earlier, we're using uh, OAIORE. Uh, SCOS is a standard um, ontology for concepts, and we're trying to leverage many different global identifier relationships. So let me, um, this is way too tiny and detailed to see, but, uh, but I wanted to give you an idea of what the, where we are in the project now in terms of the ontology. Um, so the ontology working groups, this was the November 18th iteration of sort of how we were trying to combine, deal with the issue of combining identifiers and relating them, them to works within the project. I understand the November 25th version is a little bit different than this. So this is um, very much a, an ongoing uh, effort. Um, it will also, it's also going to be changing to reflect changes in the external environment. BibFrame is potentially looking at an update to how, how BibFrame person is, uh, is interpreted. Um, but again, I wanted to give you a sense of some of the kinds of issues that we're dealing with here. So as an example, we want to be able to relate BibFrame's notion of person, which is currently really a library authority notion, with the real world person notion of a system like friend of a friend. Um, an example that may or may not uh, be fully accurate, but you can think of Samuel Clemens as the real friend of a friend person, and Mark Twain as a BibFrame persona for that, uh, for that individual connected with a lot of uh, of works. Um, another example, we then want to tie out to these external identifiers, and we need to tie appropriately. So ISNI has the notion of a persona, so Mark Twain may well get his own ISNI. Um, Samuel Clemens uh, may have a, uh, a folk person relation to some other identifier, an orchid, whatever. Um, in the case of, again, we may have information about people that is not currently captured by an external global identifier, but that we want to be able to maintain and carry forward. An example of this shows up a lot in Vivo, where you have co-author information, and you have very little information about the co-author. You may only have a first initial and a name, but you need to persist that in the system and make it available so that potentially other folks can reconcile that information and produce a global URI eventually. Um, final example, we need to relate BibFrame's notion of a work with the OCLC notion of a work and, and have that expressed directly. So what are the ontology challenges? So we need to think about in, in our ontology work identifying people and their relationships to other entities. Um, there are already identifiers out there for people and works which we need to try and connect VF, ORCID, ISNI, Vivo, all sorts of them. And there are hard choices around the edges to be made. For example, in the case of Samuel Clemens or others, single people with multiple identities, we need to make sure that we, we don't uh, get so obsessed with the details of how we represent the incredibly complex cases that we don't move forward on the general problem. So, one aspect of the general problem is the, gener the notion of entity reconciliation. So if I have two representations, I have a Vivo URI for somebody and I have a VF for them, how do I reconcile those? How do I decide that, in fact, these are talking about the same person? And in general, that's a really important problem for us. Um, within our own systems, uh, I talked about the local silos. We need to be able to link information across our library systems. In many cases, we'll have common IDs within a single institution, but in some cases, we don't, and we need to do work to do that reconciliation. 
It's absolutely essential to link across the three partners to support discovery, annotation, virtual collections. We need to do this for works, for people, places, subjects, and, and many other different kinds of relationships. And finally, linking the web of linking to the web of linked open data, linking to that big cloud of stuff out there, um, surfaces new relationships and networks that we can use to enhance discovery and description and understanding of our resources. So I think the library role in all of this is to expose our own unique entities and figure out how to connect them out to the rest of the world. And the more that we can link and the more that we can reconcile, the more that we're going to be able to discover. Let me talk about a slightly subtler version of that. If I can only reconcile between two researchers the fact that they're part of the same organization, I can only say these two researchers are very loosely coupled and they may not much have much in common. But if I have a strong set of connections between them, then I can make the statement that, well, if somebody finds a resource by one of these researchers, they might well be very interested in resources by the other one. These are closely coupled and it's not just people, it's other kinds of close, strong coupling that can potentially enhance relevance ranking research and discovery. So how will the Linked Data for Libraries project uh, make these connections? Um, we're using ontologies commonly found in linked data. I've talked about some of those. Um, by connecting with Cornell Vivo, with the Stanford Community Academic Profiles, Harvard Profiles Information. By using persistent stable local identifiers, which we can then associate with global identifiers including ORCID v. Afinisni, by supporting annotations with provenance, and by linking to external sources of networked relationships, things like DBpedia, IMDB, the entire web of OCLC information, all of those. And really what we're seeking here is using linked data as a standard that can uh, serve as sort of a lingua franca across different organizations, across different disciplines, across international boundaries. Um, it, it really is a standard that's, that's widely shared and widely usable. So there's your quick introduction to the ontology piece of this. And now Tom is going to talk about the engineering side. Uh, thankfully, Dean transitioned off the Tower of Babel before we got to the engineering. I was wondering if he was asking me to cover um, <laughs> the more perilously fraught uh, part of the project. Um, so, uh, uh, Dean gave an excellent overview of some of the things that we're trying to do within the project in terms of unlocking silos of library information. And um, I, after our initial um, foundational meetings of the project launch once uh, this January and February, where we really got our arms around what does this actually mean. We have a lovely 17-page proposal uh, with great text and long lists of uh, potential ontologies to link to. And I think this diagram, more than any other, boils down to me kind of the essence of what we're trying to achieve. Um, which is that basically within each research institutions like Cornell, like Harvard, and like Stanford, we've got rich pools of data for describing our bibliographic resources, so our, our collections. We've got fantastic set of person data uh, that might come through uh, profiles information such as Vivo, uh, Harvard Profiles, or, or Stanford's CAP. Um, as well as great links out to library world authority files and the growing set of researcher authority files like ORCID or ISNI. Um, we also have a large pool of data around what might be broadly classified as usage data or curation data that actually are the things or the objects being used, being gathered into the reference list, into digital collections, into course syllabi, and yet each of these things largely exist in their own sets of worlds with very few connections across. So linked data for libraries is really looking at the libraries maybe is too limiting or has a very expansive role of what we consider a library, is to look at exploiting these other pools of data at institutions and across research organizations and research structures to try to figure out how to answer key questions, not just about discovery, though that's, that's a critical piece of it, um, but also uh, more fundamental questions <clears throat> uh, leading people from one resource to another for multiple reasons. Now, the multiple reasons, I don't know how many of you have been in a room with ontologists or self-described ontologists. Um, it's fascinating. 
Um, and it can be time consuming. And it turns out that no one is right and no one is wrong uh, because oftentimes it's not quite clear what the objectives are. And one of the early principles we established in the course of this project is we could have wonderfully ornate and elaborate models describing our individual data sets and our views of the world, but what are we actually trying to do? Um, and what will the benefit be to some predefined set of users? And, and an anchoring principle for this project is that the ontology development and the engineering would both be guided by a set of real world use cases. Now, I don't know how many of you have tried to come up with real world use cases for linked data, uh, but typically there is a process where there's um, uh, Eighty percent of the effort uh, talks about conceptually what you could do, and then uh, there's 16 percent of it on the ontology and concrete models, and then there's a little bubble that says killer app invented here. Um, and so uh, what we wanted to do was move that, to, and the killer app, I've yet to be part of a project where the killer app has emerged, though I think Vivo actually has many of the aspects of one. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was actually try to characterize up front uh, what we were trying to accomplish using what data for what purpose. And so this actually was um, uh, an interesting process. And we went through, kind of we resulted to an agile form of uh, requirements gathering called stories or use case development. Kind of just trying to boil things down from abstract notions. If I collect, connect this cloud here to that cloud there with some kind of predicate, goodness will result to very concrete, familiar structure if you look up um, uh, stories or use cases um, as a kind of user, I want to take some form of action in order that I can realize this benefit. Um, and then with each one of those, trying to characterize what are some potential demonstrations of this from our various institutional contexts, what are the data sources that then might be required, I might need some kind of bibliographic data mixed with some kind of person data, mixed with some kind of usage or circulation data. Um, therefore, what might the ontology requirements be? Do I actually care that Mark Twain and Samuel Clemens are the same or different or the relationship between those? And then finally, the engineering work to support that. So this, I was pleased at how clean this slide looked when I produced it last night um, because actually, uh, this, this was just an absolute riot, working across three different institutions with three different engineering and requirements gathering cultures and different understandings of what use cases were. That was sort of, this, that's what we ended up to. Um, what we started with was incredibly messy, or I guess we might say organic and robust. Um, with use cases, well, if it's a Tuesday, this is it's a Tuesday night on AstroTurf with a left-handed pitcher facing the Giants in the 1960s, what are the percentage chances? We had some very far out use cases, uh, which if you've been in part of linked data discussions, you probably had those too. Um, but what we did succeed in doing was capture uh, 42 concrete use cases of various forms and various levels of aspiration, um, pulling on the different, uh, drawing on the different pools of data described earlier. Um, and what was remarkably refreshing is by the end of about two or three months of analysis and uh, combinatorial exercises, we actually identified that there were really six clusters of use cases that we were talking about, and we managed to reduce those to 12 pretty concrete, pretty believable statements of uh, potential benefit for leveraging linked data in a library context. And those clusters really dealt with the combinations across the pools of data that until now are, are, are largely unjoined, are largely unlinked within our individual con um, institutional context or across the con uh, institutions. So the first one was really, the, the use, first use case cluster was the combination of bibliographic uh, and curation data, which has given a set of, uh, of information resources and given knowledge about how those things have been used or tagged or classified. Um, could I actually drive relevance and discovery operations or processes based on that information? Uh, the second one, was a combination of bibliographic and person data. Uh, Dean gave an excellent example in the earlier slides uh, with the, the search, uh, you can find an item in the Cornell catalog done by a Cornell researcher. Um, if you actually had the uh, URI linking to that researcher's identity, you could actually discover uh, where that person's lab was, what the current research was, who that person's uh, current collaborators or past collaborators were. If you could do future, there'd be a lot of money in that and we should write that one down. 
Um, the, uh, so all sorts of information about could I pivot between this knowledge and understanding of people and their relationships as represented in systems like B uh, Vivo with uh, the traditionally rich uh, but siloed information about uh, library bibliographic resources. Third was really talking about linking into the wider world of linked data by leveraging uh, what we call authorities um, within our context, but if based on the notions of not just strings, but things for places, for subjects, for entities uh, like people or organizations, can I drive uh, better discovery processes and, and better analytics? Uh, fourth was a set of clusters that was getting more into some of the um, the more advanced features and capabilities of linked data. So things like uh, through inferencing multiple joins or following multiple links, uh, can I in fact get to something about uh, follow a search um, on the Civil War and end up with a rich set of collections of costume design used in 20th century uh, theater for 19th century costumery, which is one of the more ambitious examples that we captured in the 42 raw use cases. Uh, the fifth was really driving um, the, the leveraging of circulation data. Um, based on how often a, a resource might be checked out, consulted, or used, some of this data is available to us uh, in various forms at our uh, institutional libraries. Can I drive processes uh, in Amazon-like ways for people who uh, found this useful also found this useful? Um, or the fact that this was circulated multiple times to faculty at a particular institution might drive recommendations at another institution. I'll have to say that this has provoked some interesting philosophical discussion among the partners and we're still sorting this about whether it's meaningful and whether it's a good idea. Um, uh, and it's, it's been expansive, uh, mind expanding. Um, and then the sixth one is really, can we do an aggregation of the data? What if we thought about uh, not just bibliographic uh, person and curation data and at individual institution like, or three individual institutions, but if we combine those across our three or across 30 or 300 institutions, what might you be able to discover about the academic environment writ large? Um, and I'm going on at some length for these use cases because I actually feel, one, is because one of the things that we did, so we're celebrating success. Um, but two is I feel like uh, this is really a, a very concrete deliverable that maybe and possibly probably has applicability at institutions and for linked data efforts beyond uh, the linked data for libraries project. And um, one of the things that we had found in the course of this, for example, was that the BibFrame initiative, uh, which Dean described, actually also had a set of use cases um, taken from a slightly different angle, and as we looked at those, they were immensely helpful for, to us in terms of clarifying what our thinking was and what our objectives were. Um, so at the bottom of this page, you will find the LD4L use cases. I think if you do a Google search, LD4L use cases, uh, it's the first thing that comes up. Um, but just to give an uh, example of two of the summary of the use cases from the first use case cluster, uh, which was about curation data and bibliographic resources, um, so the first one is building a virtual collection. One of the use cases we have at Stanford is we have a lot of people who are adding things to exhibits or research guides. Our librarians are very interested in having knowledge that that has uh, relevance in a context outside the bibliographic record. Um, they want that searchable and findable and to add to the discovery process. Our metadata department doesn't want them touching the catalog record with that information. And we have the kind of this mismatch. This is a great example where we can do basically a mashup or a linking of these two disparate pools of data and actually meet a number of use cases which are broadly described as the librarians want to start tagging the catalog. And when your librarians want to tag the catalog, I think that's telling you something that you've got some fundamental opportunities. Um, but as a faculty member or librarian, I want to create a virtual collection or an exhibit uh, spanning multiple collections th so that I can share that with a class, a set of researchers, a set of students in a disciplinary, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second is uh, uh, related to that, but is tagging scholarly information resources to support reuse. So as a librarian, I would like to be able to tag a resource into a curated list so that I can then feed those lists out, think of RSS or syndication, to subject guides, course reserves, reference collections, uh, personal profile pages. 
And by taking a well-curated list like the library catalog and by adding these tags, I might suddenly expose all sorts of potential opportunities for information syndication and information referencing, even across um, knowing in one of Dean's examples uh, that a resource that was held in common at Stanford and Cornell's collection was in the Cornell Librarian's Research Guide for that topic could be useful information that we would want to expose at, within Stanford. So uh, another thing that we uh, has anchored the work on LD4L so far is that not only do we want to um, have a rich ontology and not only do we want to have a set of use cases, we actually want to have a set of pooled data and applications uh, uh, built off of that data to demonstrate value. Um, so one, one of the things that we've done is phase the work in, uh, broadly speaking, three, three big waves. So uh, the first is to focus really on annotations, so this use case cluster one that I just read through. Um, the second is also a well-established territory, and there's been good work, though largely not well leveraged at our individual institution, which is to leverage authorities and part of the day-to-day -day work of the library in, the, in terms of support of the scholarly process. So discovering works via people and their relationships, so uh, discovering works via locations and their relationships, there are rich and authoritative um, uh, vocabularies and uh, URIs describing places. And uh, the nice thing about Earth is we all live in the same place and typically are, are writing about the same place. Um, lots of different uh, local implementations and local experiments have been done to try to exploit that data to find other works about this place, written by authors from this place, uh, and then you can also extend that into time. Uh, the, there's uh, two more, which is to discover works via concepts, which is getting into slightly slippier ontological grounds. Um, and one is not to discover works, the, the one that's not listed here is but to describe works actually using uh, URIs and entities. So instead of um, going up to the very beginning of the process and instead of doing cataloging and description, whether by librarians or by end users, say in an institutional repository, is encourage them to start doing description using linked data, whether or not they're, they're aware that they're using linked data. Um, the third phase is really getting into some of the more advanced work, which is uh, leveraging linked open data in general. So leveraging the deeper graph, this notion of inferencing and complex queries and joins. Uh, leveraging usage data is the, does the fact that something was checked out 15 times actually make it more or less relevant? How do you actually express that data? How do you, uh, how do you integrate that data into your discovery process or your recommendation process? And then the sixth one is this pool of, of commingled data. And at this point in the project, uh, uh, 11 months into the 24-month cycle, um, we're in these relative phases. So engineering on, uh, solid engineering work on the first one, uh, we're in planning and assessment mode for the second one, a lot with the collection analysis that Dean described earlier. And we're really uh, re in the research and kind of still concept conceptualization phase uh, for the last cluster. One of the things that Dean mentioned is that we are trying to make sure that um, this is, uh, this work is well grounded in current engineering and um, uh, information infrastructures of our three institutions and it's also applicable beyond the lifespan of the grant. That it's not simply a research grant but something that's leading, we hope, to real information services. Um, Dean actually put this in, not me, I have to say, and then he put it in my part of the slide deck. Uh, but one of the things I can say is Cornell is very excited about Hydra, and as they were thinking, as they were thinking about adopting uh, the project, they wanted something, they wanted a solid foundation from which to start and something that would give them a head start. Um, and one of the things that they were looking at was using the Hydra application framework on top of a triple store on the back end. And Cornell's information architecture basically has a triple store where they're amalgamating lots of different sources of things that other institutions like Stanford have already put into um, largely a digital repository. They're doing a kind of a different take at the integration. Um, so uh, if you're familiar with Hydra, um, it is an application framework that sits on top of Fedora, which is content middleware. It's a very common uh, digital repository system. There are uh, collaboratively built solution bundles that are used by many parts of the community for systems like digital collection presentation, description, institutional repository services. 
Uh, it has, at this point, I think 26 or 27 signed partners, and the project motto is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I think speaking to one of the reasons that Cornell was interested in seeing their work in this uh, being picked up by a wider community and also sustained by a wider community over time. As it so happens, that's true as Stanford, for example, and other hydro partners are quite interested in this. Um, just in terms of anchoring the technical componentry, um, basically there is an application stack which uses solar and blacklight for the read and presentation view, uh, and it uses a Ruby on Rails gem called Hydrahead, which assembly is, is, what's, is the application logic and what's presented to the users, and all of that is written to Fedora on the back end. And I think the interesting thing here is, is there the possibility to actually replumb Hydra, so instead of using um, a component called uh, active Fedora, which is what lets you put a Ruby on Rails stack on top of Fedora, making it look like a, a relational database management system, you're putting Hydra componentry on top of a triple store. Um, so you can actually explode all of your data into RDF, store a bunch of associated blobs. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about this, you've got me going. Um, <laughs> You can store a bunch of associated blobs, but in the fact with the componentized mar architecture, could, can Hydra effectively become the native triple store and the native linked data store for libraries at large? Now, what happened between the time the grant proposal and many parts of this slide were written and now is that the Fedora 4 project went into production release last week. Uh, it is a native RDF store. Uh, and in fact, Cornell has cleverly adopted the name of an existing component uh, written by uh, Oregon State and now taken up by the Digital Public Library of America called Active Triples to do exactly what was so presciently described in the grant. And in fact, we've seen a great example of convergence and reuse where you can actually store linked data for libraries and others inside Fedora or inside a Hydra stack as a core component of the architecture. So well predicted, um, <laughs> Dean. Um, so the good news is, is that in a broader sense, not only is this all the onto ontological work and the use case development going on, but a lot of the componentry to store and then resurface these, uh, these linked data and these RDF assertions are actually being built into a common library stack, uh, library IT stack. Um, a related part, uh, related part of this Okay, sorry, I was touching Dean's computer and it went to a different screen. Um, is that uh, for the open annotate or for the annotation use cases clusters where people are uh, building curated collections or enriching, um, enriching knowledge of records but not necessarily enriching the catalog record itself, uh, we are using a, um, uh, a, a, we're using an information pattern called open annotations. Uh, or open annotation for linked data, which is to be able to describe these things in a generic way and store them. Um, at Stanford, part of our engineering work has been uh, work on a component called Trianon, which speaks to the second bullet there, which is to be able to uh, take open annotations, uh, take RDF, uh, express it as open annotations, uh, convert that into linked data, store that into Fedora, and then be able to retrieve and visualize that. Um, which is work that's also going on. There'll be more discussion on that tomorrow at the Fedora for Early Adopters if anyone is interested. Uh, we're also interested in using Blacklight, uh, this, this UI component of uh, the Hydra stack, not only for applying annotations, so a tagging interface that many of you have seen and already have in your catalog systems, but then also be able to retrieve that information from underlying triple stores. So if this uh, information was used in a research guide at three different institutions, it would be able to surface that. Um, so it's actually not only having the underlying uh, data and data models, uh, but it's some kind of user interface that actually floats that back to researchers in a useful way. And then finally, um, for this uh, use case 3.4, which was omitted from the previous slide, we want to actually, for depositors into uh, digital library or repository systems, actually be able to not just enter in uh, random strings, but URIs or uh, good, strong entities as they're describing the place of publication, the topic, or uh, contributor to a work. Another component um, in this environment is Library Cloud, and this comes out of uh, Harvard's work over the last multiple years where they have assembled bibliographic pools from all across the Harvard library system uh, and produced a, uh, a data aggregation and a set of APIs as well as some visualizations on um, a view of the Harvard library, uh, Harvard library system's data. 
Um, so this is also one of the services that sits on top of this is something called shelf um, stack map, no, stack score, um, with, which is powered by an algorithm called shelf rank. And over the years, um, from the Harvard Law, Harvard Law Innovation Library yeah. lab, Harvard. I heard Tracy giggling, sorry, my apologies. Um, it, my confusion, it's, it's clear. Uh, is that the um, trying to figure out based on circulation status and circulation data what's been used more and what therefore might be more relevant. And this is driving a lot of the early modeling that we're doing on the usage data. Um, the Library Cloud is also the data store that we're using to try to figure out what um, the conversion into linked data. Uh, so it's the source data for the LD4L instance. Um, as we think about assembling the data, so from those three big pools of data, um, we're but this is how we've kind of uh, divided up the world at Stanford, which is the first and uh, the area that we're doing engineering work on right now is annotations. It's the least encumbered and the least controversial and with the open annotation model, perhaps one of the best understood. Um, uh, so that's the working from right to left, that's our, our nice rows column. Uh, in the middle, we think that there's a lot of profitable work to be done in Lime, uh, which is really trying to focus on understanding uh, people, place, and agent, uh, people, place, agent, and topic modeling, relating those to strong URIs that have already been done in the community via many of the, uh, the ontologies and sources that Dean described earlier, and then enriching our records uh, to the degree that they haven't already been enriched. Um, the third area where we're seeing some co-evolution, I think, with the uh, BibFrame and the general library community is to try to figure out the best way to express our MARC records and our other pools of traditional bibliographic resources as linked data. And that's still a work in progress. Uh, after all of that is converted, conceptually that goes into one big triple store or a bunch of interlinked triple stores at a single institution which is then surfaced through a set of APIs for linking. And uh, if you imagine this diagram in triplicate, one might think of Cornell, Harvard, and Stanford uh, all aggregating their data as well uh, into one even bigger pool at the very end or towards the end of the project. So some of the working assumptions and I think some of the things that make the, this process interesting is that this is a project that if it's not unique is perhaps rare at, in the scale at which it's trying to accomplish this. So I think individually any single one of these institutions, this would be a notable, trying to do it in common across three institutions with the linking and common engineering and common tooling um, gives us a massive collection of potential resources. Uh, bibliographic resources, but also a pool of people um, and uh, curation data. Um, trying to understand the pipeline and the workflows is going to be important, and we've built this in as a working assumption that this is not a one-time conversion that we're going to get right the first time, because we've already done it multiple times and, and not well. Um, as trying to understand the pipeline and a repeatable process for generating, relating, augmenting, versioning, uh, and backing out changes to this, uh, these triple stores. Uh, and the third thing is how can we build useful services that sit on top because again the purpose is not just to have more data, the purpose is to expose data and useful services to end users. So Dean alluded to some of the challenges um, uh, a little bit earlier. Um, so one of the things I think we're constantly finding is the perfection is the enemy of the good or spending too much time documenting or tackling the .001% of the use cases. Uh, the Mark Twain Samuel Clemens discussion was an hour and a half of some of the smartest people I know on a telephone call in unlit windowless rooms. I wasn't on it. Um, but it's, uh, it was a time-consuming uh, process, and I think the answer was we actually don't know um, at the end, or it, there isn't necessarily a single good answer. Um, the second is this notion of minting versus finding identifiers. Is there's already these masses of linked data and URIs that are out there. Do we really want to add to this pool with new identifiers? If we're going to add to this pool, how do we do this reconciliation or this linking across? It's a fundamental challenge and one that I think the, the linked data community in general um, hasn't quite mastered. Um, wider issues is are your Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain again, are you talking about the same thing or are you talking about two things with the same name but slightly different? So same as or see also. Uh, just the scale uh, requires a fair amount of computational uh, time and computational power. Um, our DevOps and sysadmins groups kind of blanched when they saw the request that came in from the linked data engineer uh, when he spec'd out the machine that he wanted. Uh, so his expectations were reset, uh, but it is kind of a fundamental challenge if you want to churn through lots of MARC records and do it multiple times because you didn't do it right or well the first time. 
Um, leveraging other technologies, we don't want this to stand in isolation. We're not, I think none of the three institutions are interested in producing research wear. Uh, and certainly none of us are interested, or Stanford's not interested, interested in sustaining research wear. Um, and I think finally, even though it is linked, for data for, linked data for libraries and we're looking largely outside the bibliographic box, we spend an awful lot of time talking about bibliographic data, perhaps because that's our richest source and because that's where so much work has already been done. Um, but it's a constant challenge to try to extract ourselves from that and think about the wider world. So at the end, um, really I think if we're successful, we're looking at a state where uh, linked data becomes the standard, not an after the fact conversion process. And ideally, um, library descriptions of our resources will refer to identified uh, entities, uh, the two things, not strings or stings. Um, they will be discoverable in concert with other types of metadata from all different sources. Um, they will be aware of and leverage other types of institutional and trans-institutional data uh, from the institution's identity management systems, for example, to create coherent and richer local authority files. What is our notion of this entity? Um, we'll have interoperability across libraries, so we won't have to worry if Cornell's Mark Twain is the same as our Mark Twain. Um, and then we'll be able to inter interoperate across the wider world of linked data on the web. Um, so, <laughs> the um, project timeline is, uh, uh, we've roughly divided it in, into four quarters, uh, so of uh, six months, uh, yes, it, that's confusing because each quarter is six months, which is not the academic quarter. Um, but the first quarter of the project, we really were spent on trying to identify the data sources, um, the existing vocabularies to use rather than creating one whole cloth, um, under, begin the initial ontology design, and we spent a lot of time on the use cases. For the last six months, we're just coming to the end of phase two. Um, phases, we're, there are four phases to the project, that's a better term. Uh, we're looking at completing the initial ontology. Um, uh, Cornell has done good work uh, de uh, deploying and extending the existing active triples um, uh, componentry from the Hydro project and pilot data ingests into a vitro based instance at Cornell. Um, we're hoping to have a halfway checkpoint of the process at a major workshop uh, that will be held at Stanford in February with the notion that um, we should invite uh, 10 to 12, and we have invited, uh, 10 to 12 uh, interested other institutions in the linked data space to go into a deeper dive about the planning, the use cases, the ontology, the engineering, the assumptions, and, what we, and the tooling that we expect to emerge from the project. Um, we'll go in detailed overview of the ontology and the, the project as a whole, obtain feedback on the overall construct and make sure that we're not doing things that, um, if not uh, limited to a single institution's parochial view, are n also not limited to our um, triumvirate partnerships. Um, one of the things that we want to do at this is make sure that we're really leveraging the wider community of linked data, both in terms of the existing entities that are out there and the services that are already being built on top, such as by DPLA, um, by, B by Vivo, by Share, uh, also very interested in parallel developments by Bibframe, OCLC, and Zephira in this space. Uh, the third phase of the project is really to move more towards uh, uh, live services with pilot instances across all three partners, um, uh, beginning to cross-populate multiple data moved to the second and third phases of, of the use cases. And the capstone of the project will be uh, this time next year, uh, when you may see us again, uh, which is uh, implement fully functional LD4L instances, um, massive relating of uh, entities across our different institutions, and successfully demonstrated use cases in mul across multiples of the clusters. Um, one of the interesting things about the project is that it is uh, really brought together not only three different institutions, but th uh, multiple different groups uh, across institutions that sometimes don't always talk to each other. So at Stanford, for instance, our technical services and metadata department really is keenly interested in this because I think they see this as part of the future of bibliographic description in a lot of their workflows. Uh, of course, the library technology uh, unit, which is mine, is, is deeply invested in this. We also have researchers across uh, the pool of three institutions who are looking at the information science and the theory. Um, it's, it's been a rich partnership in that sense. Um, 
we are seeking to expand the LD4L community and the effort. Um, everything is on the, uh, a publicly accessible wiki, or almost everything is on a publicly accessible wiki, um, which, where the use cases were documented. We encourage people to read, comment, and contact us. Um, and we will uh, actively continue to try to exploit the relationship between the Vivo and the Hy or with the Vivo and the Hydra communities in particular. Uh, lovely screenshot, Meyer Library behind us has now got cyclone fencing around it. You can no longer go there. It's a big concrete monstrosity. Uh, that's why we took it there. It's the end of that. Um, at the end of the project, we're hoping um, that for a couple of major developments. One is that we'll really have a much better sense of how these different ontologies and pools of data should interrelate to accomplish things that actually advance the mission of the libraries. Uh, two is we should have tooling that supports the conversion, the relation, the editing, and the visualization of these. So not only an ontology, but actual engineering that makes a good use of these and helps produce or manifest the data. And then three, that a lot of this, that tooling and the engineering will be deeply embedded and integral to the already large communities of um, Hydra, Blacklight, uh, uh, Active Triples, and Vivo. So in summary, actually I'll turn this over to Dean because he's got a funny story. I, what he tells me is a funny story about the ivory-billed woodpecker. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, I don't know if you're familiar with the ivory-billed woodpecker, but uh, it may or may not be extinct at the moment, um, and, and there's a lot of information on it, Cornell's Laboratory of Ornithology. So uh, really the, little, the message of this slide is that we really need to evolve and collaborate as libraries if we are going to stay relevant to the, uh, to the academic mission. I thought it might be so we could help find the ivory-billed woodpecker, yeah, well, but actually you're saying we are the ivory-billed woodpecker, we, we, perhaps. We, we want to make sure we are not the ivory-billed woodpecker. You, you've got it. I'm the slow one in the group, <laughs> or the literal one. 